Well, um, my guess is that many or maybe most of you have not done deep, you know, in-depth study in the last three verses of the book of Titus, or maybe in-depth study in the last three verses in the book of any letter that has any closing. Because uh, I know in going through our Bible reading plan and whatever reading you may be doing in your, in your time, uh, go ahead and out yourself. It, how many of you have maybe sped through the ends of letters and kind of just kind of blah, 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 on to the next one, right? Oh, this is the end. The final greetings, the final instructions just kind of seems like um, personal, right? It's talking about other people and where to go and where to meet me. And, um, but this is the word of the Lord. Just as we said together, and we should be thankful for it, um, God has a purpose for these verses. We should lean in. We should lean in to see what God is seeking to teach us from this. Before we do that, let's just give a quick overview of where we've been, because this is the last time we'll be in the book of Titus. Uh, very important book, very small letter, uh, only three chapters, but packed full of very important teaching for us and for his church The main idea, as we've talked about again and again, is that we are to have sound doctrine, right teaching, full doctrine, the word sound healthy, complete, right, and when we have that sound and right doctrine, it will inevitably and must result in sound living, sound deeds. And so as we heard about what's going on in the time that Paul was writing to Titus in the island of Crete, there wasn't sound doctrine in every place. There was false teachers that were there, and they were spreading this false teaching, and they were living in, un, in, in inappropriate ways, and it was affecting the church. And so as we've seen in many of the letters in, in, in the Bible, the, the New Testament letters, false teaching and false living is a significant problem for many churches, and it needs to be dealt with. And so we see then that being dealt with here. And so because we need godliness, good, good doctrine and godliness starts with the elders. And he talks about appointing elders and the need for their godliness and the need for their being to be male qualified uh, men who can lead in that and not only in their godly lives but then to be able to then rebuke the false doctrine the false teaching the false living very important uh, christians are not to let sin remain in the church no let uh, false teaching remain and we're to deal with it appropriately decisively and to be led through the the elders to do so in chapter two Uh, After contrasting in chapter 1, the godliness of the elders and the ungodliness of the false teachers, chapter 2 is all about the church and the church members and how they are to be godly. They are to have sound doctrine, not just the leaders, but all people. And so that will affect all the the members, old men, young men, young women, old women. They're all to be godly. They're all to be devoted to good doctrine and good living. And even to be aware of how to live amongst outsiders, how to be devoted to good works. In fact, that good works comes up again and again. Our good doctrine will lead to good works, and so we must be devoted to that so that people might come to faith, people might see the trueness of Christ. And so this last week, we had the correcting of false teachers again, in particular what to do with them, that we should, should, we should resist false teaching and then discipline those who are divisive. And so um, in our time today, we're going to be dealing with the closing instructions and the further teaching there. And so we're going to ask this question for this morning, which is, what must we learn from the final instructions written to the letter to Titus? What are in these particular verses that God, through the Holy Spirit, made sure that his church would have a witness to believe and understand? These are not throwaway verses. These are very important for us. What does God have for us this morning that we should hear? Well, if you're writing notes, if it's helpful for you, you can put this point down. It's this. Our first point for this morning is that churches must diligently support gospel workers. Churches must diligently be devoted to, earnestly seek to support gospel workers. We're going to see that in particular in how Paul talks about his missionary apostolic band of brothers who are, who are ministering there in the, in the gospel, and we're going to see what these details actually help us to see here, which is that we must support gospel workers based on what's happening here. Verse 12, let me read. Now Paul is speaking to Titus here and says, When I send Artemis, which was a brother there, or Tychicus, another brother, so he's, he's, Paul is, hasn't quite figured out yet that he's going he's gonna to send one of these two brothers to Titus. What does he say to you? He says, Do your best. Make every effort to, to come to me at Nicopolis. Why? Because 
Titus was going to then leave the church of Crete, and he was going to be replaced by one of these brothers, and he was going to be helpful then to Paul. It says, for I have decided to spend the winter there at Nicopolis, which is another place. And then in verse 13, it says, do your best. Same thing. Do your best. Make every effort. This is an important thing. Paul is actually stressing the importance here. Make every effort to come to me. Make every effort to speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way and see that they lack nothing. Again, my guess is you haven't spent much time thinking about these verses. But I was very encouraged as uh, I read and studied and prayed and was encouraged by the witness of the saints over the years on how God has much to say here. Um, let's go over some of the details first. Paul is seeking to replace Titus because Titus is a helpful brother, faithful in, in his service to the Lord and service to Paul. Uh, Paul is going to send one of these brothers, Artemis. Artemis, we don't know anything about Artemis. This is the only time that it wa- his name is mentioned in the Bible. But we do know something about Tychicus. Um, he is also a faithful brother. He's mentioned in Colossians and Ephesians and, and other places. In fact, Tychicus... Um, is mentioned to be a faithful brother who has been helpful, and we think that in the end, that when this is happening, that it's likely that Tychicus was not the one who stayed in the island of Crete, that it was likely Artemis, because we see later on in Paul's writings, in particular in 2 Timothy, we see that Tychicus is brought up later as being sent and involved in the the church in Ephesus. So it seems like Paul is writing in such a way to say, hey, we are doing gospel ministry and we are moving people around as has needed. If you remember, uh, Paul sent Titus there to set up elders and appoint them in the churches there in Crete. And what's interesting and what's important for us to see is that leadership really matters in church, that um, Titus, who is there and who is working for, for the gospels, working in, in, in making sure that there is sound doctrine and that there are men who are being built up and established as elders, that, that maybe they're, they're not, those elders aren't ready yet. And so what is Paul doing? He's sending other qualified men who are helpful, like Tychicus or Artemis, who are faithful, like Titus is going to be leaving. He doesn't want the church to be without faithful, godly leadership, even amongst churches that are uh, newer or maybe need more help in establishing um, their, their maturity. And so, what does he say? When I send a replacement for you, you, Titus, come to me. We will be together in Nicopolis, which was another uh, city in which Paul was able to spend the winter there. Many, Many thoughts of what he could be doing there, but what matters here is that we understand that Paul is a gospel worker, and Paul is sending other gospel workers according to what is needed in the different cities. He's going from country to country, from town to town. He's preaching the gospel. He's also visiting other places. He's also getting in trouble, Uh, times where he's gotten arrested. We think this is not a time where he is arrested at this point in between his third and fourth missionary journey. But this is Paul's apostolic missionary band. It's actually the Lord's apostolic missionary band, of which Paul is one of them. And we see that these gospel workers are moving around as as is needed. And so what is he saying to, to, to Titus? Hey, I'm going to send help to you there, Titus, and I want you to come to me. I have need for you, and I want you to be a blessing, to be a help to Zenus the lawyer, also a person who's never been mentioned besides this verse, um, which shows you, by the way, that there are lots of people who are faithful, who are working, who um, are either no names or people don't know about, but they're doing a good job, right? We're grateful that, in fact, wouldn't it be true that if you just think about it for a sec, there are many more people who are faithful and sound and helpful in the church of Christ that we don't know anything about than the ones who we do know about. Isn't that true? And so, it's an encouragement to, to be reminded that our call as individual Christians, our call as churches, is to be faithful, is to be found just like Tychicus was, was to be found faithful like Artemis, to be a person who could be used wherever is needed, wherever God has a calling to. That's, that's true for us. It doesn't matter whether our name is known, whether our ministry is, is prominent what matters is, is Christ being glorified, is his word being preached, are his people being discipled, is, are the nations being evangelized, and, and we will see him in all of his glory together, and he will reward those, some in the body with more and different things according to 
his good pleasure according to the rewards that they got for their good works, but we are all called to faithfulness. We're encouraged by even, even Zenos the lawyer. In fact, Paul has done this before. Uh, Luke is called Luke the physician, right? I think Paul likes to be helpful in, in describing people. And Luke the physician and Zenos the lawyer, uh, their vocations matter, right? Their work matters, and their, vo- their work matters to be uh, a help and to be good working unto society, but also good working unto the church, right? Zenos, we could tell if he's a lawyer, he's a sharp guy who is able to help uh, in, in any particular way that he may be needed. Luke the physician, Zenos the lawyer. I could also see somebody being helpful, Joe the plumber, right? Sarah the knitter. There are people in God's church. We all have a part to play. We all can be faithful. Let's, may we seek to do that. In fact, Paulos, we're familiar with Paulos from uh, Acts chapter 18, and he was mentioned again in in, in, uh, Corinthians chapter 1, in the the letter to Corinthians. Apparently, Paulos was a very gifted speaker, very gifted teacher, and uh, so much so that even the the church at Corinth really appreciated his ministry, but inappropriately and to the point where they really wanted to follow Paulos. In fact, they said, no, Paulos is our guy, and they were causing disruptions. He was actually seemingly that good of a leader, that good of a teacher. But we're grateful now that almost 10 years later, 10 years later when this, uh, a decade later from, from the writing of 1 Corinthians, we see Titus being written. And what do we see? Paul and Apollos are, are working together seemingly without any division, seemingly without any disruption. What an encouragement that God can unify his church and that there doesn't even, amongst Paul, there doesn't even need to be any um, clamoring for status or power. No, no, no. Whoever is helpful, whoever is useful, God is using us all. May we be found faithful. Amen? Amen. Well, what do we see here? The last part of the verse really helps us to understand what we are to, uh, a main thrust of what we are to, to learn. It's that uh, speed Zenus, the, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way and see that they lack nothing. Paul is sending Apollos and Zenos. Likely, they're the carriers of this very letter. They're the ones who have sent uh, to to the the churches of Crete, to Titus, this letter. They're the ones bringing it. They're the messengers. And what is Paul saying? Receive them. Obviously, he has because they're reading the letter. They have because they're reading the letter. And make sure that you help them. They have work to do in the gospel. They have instructions to carry out. Pray for them, supply them, help them in all that they need. Speed them on their way. Be a help to the gospel ministry. And so we as a church, we should receive these words. We should meditate on these words. We should understand these words, that all the churches of Christ are to be helpful, supportive, encouraging of gospel ministers and gospel ministry. Here, we clearly see missionary work. These are, these are apostles, evangelists, on their way, preaching the gospel, needing places to stay, needing supplies, going to certain places, and they're stopping somewhere in the middle, and they need food, they need supplies, they need encouragement. Help them get to their gospel ministry. Encourage them on their way. I've been encouraged that we have uh, our, our missionaries here now. North Africa, the Thibodeaux, we had the ability to have them uh, a couple weeks ago and praise the Lord that they are towards the end of their their break here as they're with us. They have every two years, and they have been so encouraged. I was able to have lunch with Kyle this past week, and we talked about many things, but I was encouraged to hear about all the different connections that he's made and how encouraging that has been to him, talking about the work that they're seeking to do in North Africa amongst Muslims, and how they're ready to go back. They're ready. They've been encouraged. They've been supplied. He says, "Uh, it's time. It's time to go back. I'm so grateful that we can have a relationship with gospel workers, with ministers, so that they can be ready to go and sped along their way. You know, um, I think it's true that we could say anybody who is a gospel worker, we should encourage Um, You know, that's pastors, that's evangelists, that's missionaries. But I think if we're really catching what is going on here in the letter to Titus, Paul and and the work that they're doing is an important type 
an important understanding of what missions really is. It's missions, gospel work to the people who have not who have not heard before, who need the gospel, who need the scriptures preached to them, taught to them in their language and churches to be sound. Paul has, has, has talked about this sort of missionary support and gospel working support in, in most of all of his letters. There's much uh, allusion to this sort of a thing. And he talks about them, uh, about himself often, about thank you for your support. And this is an important that I'm, we get support. Let me read from Romans chapter 15, examples of this. In 15 verse 24, he says, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. What is he doing? He's, he's doing gospel work in different places, and I want to be encouraged and helped uh, on the way. And it says, to be helped on my journey there by you, the Romans, once I've enjoyed your company for a while. In, in 1 Corinthians uh, 16, he has a similar thing. He says in verse 5, it says, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. It's his normal pattern and even expectation that churches are to be helpful, supportive, financially, supplies to missionaries and mission work. And we're going to see Philippians, he says it clearly to, to, this, to this group of Christians how they did that. And it says, and you Philippians in chapter 4, you yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, the gospel work there, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you. Oftentimes, churches can't do it because they're poor. But he's saying, hey, you guys, you helped me. Even, verse 16 in Thessalonica, you sent help for my needs once and again. And he's praising this church for their devotion to help gospel workers, particularly Paul and his missionary band. He says, verse 18 of chapter 4, For I received full payment. I got the money that you sent and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering and sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Paul is talking about the need, expectation, the appropriateness, the fittingness for Christians and local churches to be regularly, generously, sacrificially supplying the needs of gospel workers. In fact, it's not just him, it's people in connection to other gospel work, even the people who are with him. Verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, starting verse 10, he talks about Timothy. It says, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord, as am I. We're doing this. And so let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. A question for us this morning. How often do you pray for encourage, financially support, or supply the needs of gospel workers? How often? Is that your regular thought process? Is that your regular priority? Is that your regular practice to have gospel workers on the mind, missionaries on the mind, so that you can pray for them by name, encourage them for their ministry, support them, supply any needs that they may have? As I mentioned before, the type of work that Paul is doing is those amongst which he is seeking to give the gospel to where it's not been named. Romans 15, starting verse 19, talks about this ministry that he has. It says, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the, gospel Christ, uh, of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel where? Not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. It says in verse 21, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Paul is making it clear that there is a gospel ministry of preaching the good news of Jesus Christ to all nations and particularly with emphasis, his emphasis is with those who have never heard. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't appropriate, legitimate, good ministry, good cross-cultural ministry where there is already churches. In fact, many times when churches are supplied um, 
there, it's generational work. It takes a long time. And so there can be ongoing help for periods of time. Um, but we should have in mind, at least in part, at least, and not even at least, there, there should be a, a focus, just as Paul was focused with, where is Christ not named? Where is there no light of the gospel? Where is there no scriptures in their language? They must hear. There are people, there are elect, all from every tribe, tongue, and nation that must be called into the kingdom of Christ. And so we must focus our time and our efforts to make sure that all of Christ's sheep are called into his fold, into his flock. In fact, uh, we talked about this morning during the announcements that we're going to be doing our, our distinctives class. That is, this is one of the areas of our distinctives that we'll be going over a little more in depth. Um, one of our distinctives is strategic missions, that we seek to make disciples of Christ among all nations. Yes, we do. We pray for the nations. But um, giving attention to those who are unreached. That is something distinctive that we're seeking to be faithful in. And so it, I know that we as a church, we support uh, those who are uh, like like the, the Thibodeaux who are seeking to be involved in mus- Muslim missions in North Africa, which is a very important area. But there are many, many more people groups. There are many more areas. And we church, we can't do it all. We're one of many churches, but we are to be faithful. And we as a families, we can't do it all, but we are to go- be called faithful. Um, the dollars that go through our budget go towards this type of missions. But there's also missionaries and partners that you can give to as well as the Lord leads. Obviously, we give uh, to the household of faith. We give the Lord tithes and offerings. But is this something on your mind? Not, ju- not just money. Money is important, very important. Prayer, supplies, encouragement, long-term partnership for unreached strategic people group missions, just like Paul. Is this a part of your framework? Is it a part of your priority? Well, let's look uh, at the next point that we have for this morning. The first is that churches are to support diligently, make every effort, make every effort to help those gospel, gospel ministers. Well, let's look at our second point. It's this, is that churches must also be devoted to good works and especially those of urgent need. We are to be devoted to good works, especially those of urgent need. We have heard being devoted to good works all over this letter. It's repeated again and again. It's one of the main topics of of this letter. And so we see Paul once again bringing it home in the last few verses. I'm not joking. It's very important. What does he say? Verse 14. Let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. We are to be devoting ourselves to good works, those of urgent need, so that we are not unfaithful. If we look at the word here, to learn, to devote ourselves, it describes something that we need, is important for us. Do you know that we don't just have good works automatically? (laughs) We actually need to be disciplined and learn how to live out good works. And that's partnering with the Holy Spirit, that's reading his word, that's being in and around other Christians and mature Christians. The older men are to, to disciple younger men and older women, younger women, and uh, fathers and parents are to disciple their children. We're to encourage one another, stir one another up towards love and good deeds. But we are to learn. We're to learn how to do that. And we are to vote or, devote ourselves to that and to these good works, how to love the church. So first we see an emphasis on the gospel ministers, which is very important, on the the strategic, prioritized gospel ministry. That needs to be supported and helped and make sure that it's going forward. But but now we see here um, any and and other types of good works, which are particularly those of urgent need. We, We would see that Zenos and Apollos, any needs they have, of course, that would be a good work to help them. But there, these are other more broad good works as well that we can have. In fact, um, it's been helpful to me in, in, as I've spoken with different people about this. Isn't it true that if we are to pay attention to the needs that are around us, that it could be pretty over- overwhelming? That there are so many urgent needs around us everywhere we go? 
had lots of conversations uh, with some of you, with other people not here about, oh man, how do I engage with people who are on the street? How do I engage with people who are in my family? I don't know. I need wisdom. I need discernment on who do I, who do I serve in what way. It's, it, 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 could, it could be devastating. Well, Paul is not calling us to be devoted to good works as if we are the Savior, as if we are the Messiah. No, there's only one. That's Christ. We are to be devoted to good works, remembering that we have been saved and remembering that we are being strengthened by Christ to do whatever he's called us to do, that we're not called to save the world. We're called to be obedient and faithful and discerning, to be prioritized and principled in these things. And so, yes, it does take wisdom. It does take uh, learning how to do this well. But let me encourage you with some things that have been helpful to me in maybe being able to discern this using other scriptures. How are we to choose or to decide how, who those we should help? We just help everybody anywhere? Well, no, we see in scripture a, a priority of principles being laid out. First is to your own household. If you're not serving those in your own household, um, then you're not being faithful to the people that God has already given you, correct? Um, let me read from 1 Timothy chapter 5 in talking about those who have urgent need. It's talking about widows. Those, they, they're definitely needy. What does he say? Verse 3, it says, honor widows who are truly widows. And if we go down to the end of the section there, verse 8, it says, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, who? These widows, and especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. There is a priority, there is a principle to understand that we are to be devoted to good works, especially those of urgent need, but not at the expense of the people that God has already given us, meaning that we, we, we neglect the needs that God has given us. It doesn't mean that we uh, don't sacrifice in our, in our households. We are to be sacrificial and stretch and even work together to help those outside the household, but we should start and realize that God has already given us a people a people to love and to care. Um, that may be from your immediate household. There may be people not living with you. We are given in the fifth commandment to honor our father and mother. And so therefore, even if we don't live with our father and mother, we are to honor them. And if they have needs, if they have urgent needs, it is on us to be able to care for them, to make sure that they are, everything that, is in, that they need is in place, especially and foremost the gospel, if they don't know it but oh, to take care of their needs as we have the opportunity. Not only that, not only the family, which often makes sense for a lot of people, sometimes they only take care of their family needs and don't go outside of that. that was not, that's not true. But let's look at another priority here, another principle is the household of faith. Not just your household that you live in with your family, but now the household of faith, the church amongst Christians. Um, particularly your home church is, is a good and right pr place to prioritize uh, but not only that, uh, amongst Christians, there are missionaries who need help, uh, ministries that would be, uh, that God has placed on your path. We have prayed for many ministries. We don't support every single one with money or supplies, but we do support some that are closer. We know some of the ministries like the Liberty Life Center that is just blocks away, who is seeking to preach the gospel to those who are seeking to kill their children in the abortion mill. Um, we give to them, and we seek to supply their needs, but we don't give to every single one um, because God is calling us to certain things, but uh, he's called us to provide for the needs of those, not only in our household, but in the household of faith. Let me read from uh, James chapter 2, and notice that he says brother or sister, if a brother or sister, starting verse 15, if another Christian, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving him the things needed for the body, what good is that? Right? He's, he's arguing here. What is that good for? Verse 17, so faith, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. A saving faith will have evidences of good works. And so that should be to those that God is, those brothers and sisters, those people that God has placed on our path to be able to love and help, and in particular, those brothers and sisters that we fellowship with, that we're in covenant membership with, we should give that covenant priority to as we, as we do have um, church membership here, but it, it's not just them either. It's any that the Lord may provide, again, with priority in mind. 
let us just be reminded of who is our neighbor, right? The third one would be not only household, not only f- household of faith, but neighbors out there. That's neighbor, the people in your neighborhood, those, those co-workers, those neighbors that God has placed in your life, the strangers even that God puts on your path. We are often very familiar here with the Good Samaritan story. Let me read from it in verse 33 of chapter 10. It says, But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, held, he had compassion. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. This is something that God has called us to do. We're not to save every single person everywhere, but we are to keep our eyes and ears and hearts open especially to those who are in urgent need. We're to be devoted to, we're we're to be thinking about, praying about, planning for, budgeting for how we can be helpful. In fact, it's really hard if we are to act too much like Americans in our day and age or like really any group that is selfish with their money, that wants to spend it on more and more things like entertainment, more and more things that really only help their household. But no, We should be even be ready to be generous. In fact, Jesus says, and when you give, when you give to the poor, when you give to the needy, saying this is an expectation, this is what Christians do. When you pray, when you give, when you fast, we are to not do it hypocritically. We are to do it authentically as unto the Lord. Is that something that we are seeking to do? And not only that, um, again, those with urgent needs, What did Timothy say? What did Paul say to Timothy? Anybody, widows in their family, take care of them. Um, I'm reminded in James 1, just a chapter up from what we just read. James 1, 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep one unstained from the world. Hebrews 13, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. You know, uh, some of you, already know, but I just recently went down to Mexico to visit an orphanage, and it was with the intent to see if if this particular orphanage would be uh, a ministry that we would be able to partner with, that we'd be able to connect with, to be able to encourage and support. So I went down there, pastoral visit, and, and visit, vision to to see, and what I met was a brother, Dean, who had been working there right on the border of Mexico towards El Paso, where a lot of the drug wars have been, had been happening. In fact, what I saw was pretty significant and devastating. It was, it was, I, we actually only stayed there uh, a short while. They were so busy doing the work that they needed to do with these orphans, it was really hot <laughs> uh, down there. But they, it was very clear that they had been sig- significantly affected by uh, COVID, that they had people who were coming regularly to help serve in the orphanages, to build things, to help with the kids, but that uh, since COVID, many of the churches had pulled out, uh, pulled out money, pulled out trips, and he was saying, we could use any help we can get. And when we were able, took the boys with me, when we were able to go and visit them and see these children and even hear many of the stories about how this orphanage who preaches the gospel who actually, I was so encouraged, they, they memorized Bible verses every week. Uh, we were having lunch, and all the kids were, were going through Hebrews chapter, two verse, or two, chapter 12, verse 2 in Spanish, and it just really encouraged my heart that they are seeking to preach the gospel at this, at this orphanage and to disciple the children. When we were there, it was clear that uh, they, they don't have much. They don't have hardly anything, and they need a lot. And it really... Uh, reminded me that these children are pictures of neediness and how it's clear they don't have parents. In fact, many of them are affected by the cartel wars in Mexico. Their parents have been killed. Their mothers might be prostitutes. They've been taken away from their families, and, and it is good and right to go visit them and help them. And I was, I was reminded It's good. This is right. And uh, one of the main needs, I was so encouraged when I went down there, I asked them, what what do you need? Like, what, what, is there anything prioritized? What would you do if you could get one thing, two things? And he said, I care most about these children's souls, and so we need more discipleship. We need a church down here. 
We need to plant a church so that these, these children and the staff, there's hardly any churches around there, and many of them, he pointed them out, some of the very unhealthy churches or even cult churches are down there. He says, we need a church down here to, so that these children could get discipled. And he said, discipleship is what we need, discipleship. And I was expecting him to say, we need money, we need a building, we need, I was expecting physical needs, and he was focusing on spiritual needs. And, and so, praise the Lord, by, the, by that short visit there, um, I said, well, how about we, at our church, we use a children's catechism to help with these children. Maybe you already do Bible memory, maybe there could be some help in, in helping with, with doctrine. He had never heard of the Boys and Girls Catechism, and I showed him on my phone and said, uh, yeah, we do this with our family, we do this in our church, and it's been a real encouragement. Um, and as we went through it, line by line, he, I could see his eyes get bigger and get more and more excited. You guys remember how excited he got about the catechism and said, we need this. We need to teach the boys and girls, particularly this type of doctrine. It's, it's simple, but it's true. And I showed him, yeah, look at the question and the answer and the verses, and you could, you could share those things. And he was so excited. In fact, having, having only met him just a short while before, he said, if this is the only reason you came, praise the Lord. That we could get access to tools like this because we need to teach these children. And I was so encouraged by that. In fact, uh, our friend uh, Sam Renahan up the street in La Mirada, I reached out and said, Hey, Brother Sam, Pastor Sam, do you, do you know of any resources where I could get some catechisms, uh, boys and girls in Spanish? You're a Spanish guy. You, you know. You have a Spanish service. He immediately sent me a text with, uh, with you know, being able to click on the Spanish Catechism, and I immediately sent that text over to Dean, and he praised the Lord and said, I will buy these tomorrow. And I said, tell us how much they are. We'd love to help. There is a need to help those people, orphans, widows, and other places in Scripture. It says, visit those who are in prison. We're to devote, our, devote ourselves to good deeds. In fact, um, it says not only to do that, it says it positively that we're to devote ourselves to that, but it also says uh, negatively, meaning that it says we are to devote ourselves to, to good works, help those in cases, help cases of urgent need, and it says not to be unfruitful. Meaning we could be Christians and we could have sound doctrine and we could even be doing things that are good, but actually not necessarily all good. It's important for our Christian life to bear fruit the good works that come from being saved, from having a new heart, a new mind, a new will. We're not to have fruitless lives not showing the truth, not to be unfruitful. In fact, this, this just comes right in line with what Jesus said about the parable of the sower. If you remember, we were in Matthew not too long ago. We're going to go back into Matthew next, next week even. But it wasn't too long ago we went over the parables of the sower. In Matthew chapter 13, it says, uh, describing somebody who's not a true convert. What does he say? It says, For as for the one uh, what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Meaning, if we're Christians, if we're true Christians, then we are to be devoted to good works. Why? Because we are new creatures in Christ who have new desires, new wills, and we are having good works. We must not fool ourselves to think that we can think things and have good intentions, but no, it will produce good works, unlike these false professors, these false believers, where they have an experience, but it doesn't actually change them. So let me ask our question. Do you take seriously the call to be devoted to good works of urgent need? Do you take serious? Is this not only seeking to support and be devoted to gospel workers, as we all must and as we must as a church, but do, do you, do we, are, do we take this serious? Are, are we a people who seek to be godly and biblical, to have good works flow out from our lives, and even seeking to be prioritized in those who have urgent need? In fact, this is one of the main reasons that we have established, and from the very beginning of Disciple Church, we established a benevolence fund. It's not something uncommon. I pray it's more and more common. But the benevolence funds for, for us is we, we, we ask people to give above and beyond their ties to be able to say if there are cases of urgent need in our community, if there are cases where God 
bring something, a stranger, somebody along our path that we can help, that we'd be able to do so, that we would, have, we would be able to because there's funds ready and able to go. That's something that we do as a church. Do you do, you do that? Do you plan? Do you pray for? Do you ask the Lord to give you the blessing of helping somebody? I think that's something that shines the light of Christ. Christ loves us and showed his love. And so we love him and show him our love by loving others. In fact, um, that's another one of our distinctives as a church um, is compassion for the vulnerable. We seek to love our neighbors, giving attention to the most vulnerable, to the orphans, to the widows, to those people in whom the scripture seems to pull out as saying, pay careful attention to these most needy people amongst us because they, they need a father, they need a husband, they need a family, they don't have it. So pay careful attention to the most vulnerable there. And so we show our love. As we end this, this letter, we end in verse 15, going in this theme of good works and in this theme of love. Let me read it in verse 15. It says, all, notice this final greeting, last verse, all who are with me sends greeting to you. Remember, he's with a group and he's saying, we all love you, Titus. We love you. Notice the, the warmth, the enthusiasm, the love that we have for the saints. And so what does he say? Greet those who love us in the faith. We love you. Greet those who love us. Grace be w- with you all. And as we think about this last verse, it's important to see that all of these works, these works that we do to support gospel workers, these works that we do to help those who are in need to be devoted to good works, it's all motivated by love. It's not motivated by self-serving status or trying to be good with God, trying to earn favor with God. No, no, no. We do this because we've been loved by Christ. And so we're motivated by love to show love. In fact, let us end with our last point this morning, focusing on Jesus. Our last point is that Jesus is the one who supplies his work and Jesus is the one who supplies our needs. Jesus is the one who supplies his work in the world, and Jesus is the one who supplies our need. The reason why Paul can so clearly call the churches in Crete through Titus and really all the Christian church everywhere to be able to help gospel work and to be able to support and supply the needs of of, of, of people of urgent need, it's because Christ is the one who has worked and is working, and Christ is the one who supplies our needs. And so we must do this out of love and devotion and gratitude for him. Look look at Matthew, the the Great Commission, so clearly. What does Jesus say? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Why? Because he did the work of the gospel. Because he came to earth from heaven. He, he, He lowered himself. He took on the form of a man. He was in the glory with his father in heaven, and he condescended, took on human flesh. What did he do? He lived a perfect life. He lived out the law for us. And not only that, he died a death that we deserved. He took on our punishment. And so because of that, God the Father gave him all power and authority. He purchased it. And so what does he do? He calls us to work with him. He calls us to make disciples, his disciples, everywhere, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And what does he say? And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is the one working amongst his church. Jesus is the one who's calling people through gospel witness, gospel ministry, through his word. Wherever the preaching of the word is, Christ is speaking. So we must not worry or fret as if God needed us. Christ is working and he chooses to use us. What a blessing that is that he calls us into his work. and sus- I love First Corinthians chapter 1 as actually talking about Paul and Apollos and the different leaders in the church, not to divide over it. What does he say? It says, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Christ is the one who's working. God is, is the one who's working in his ministry. 
He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor, for we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. Christ supplies his work. We join him, we follow him in the power of his spirit through the, through the working of his word. He loved us first, First John. And this is love, the love of God that was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world that he might live through him, we might live through him. And in this, this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins, to satisfy all the wrath that was coming on our heads. Jesus extinguished that wrath. And now we have God's pleasurable presence. He loves us because he put his wrath on Christ. So we're grateful. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, look at how Jesus took care of our urgent need. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one who will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ is the one working and Christ is the one supplying all of our needs. He did it on the cross. He does it. He, he's in heaven now, sitting at the right hand, praying for us. He is supplying our needs. He is interceding for us. And oh, how we can come to him with our urgent needs, with our weary souls. Look at what he says. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Christian, here today, be encouraged that, yes, we are called to know the gospel and all sound doctrine that accords to the gospel, and that his Holy Spirit, through the, through the word being preached and taught, through his church, will affect our lives. This morning we went over sanctification. And we're going to continue on in that next week. But how it's the Holy Spirit who is, does divine strength. And it's through the, through the word that we get this sanctification. We're not striving in our own strength, doing our own strategies and methods. No, no, no. It's partnering with the Holy Spirit. It's focusing on what he says in his word, believing it by faith, walking in love. And so we do that. Christ meets all of our needs, and he will bless us. So, friend, look to Christ. Look to Christ who loved us and served us and supplied our needs, and may that be the motivation to help us preach the gospel, know sound doctrine, love the saints, be involved in missions, supply the needs of those who have, who have urgency, and it's all for his glory. Amen? Amen. Would you bow with me? Christ, we are so grateful for your work in us. We're so grateful for your coming to earth and living out the law joyfully. Lord, dying a death. Lord, you were not a victim, but you laid down your own life. Spirit, we're so grateful that you work deep in us. You change our hearts, and, and Lord, you give us the strength that we need. Father, it's all for your glory. We pray that you would be glorified in us, Lord, that you would sanctify us more and more to have the right views of things, the right motivations for things. So, Lord, grow our church. Grow us in devotion to doctrine and devotion to good works, devotion to prioritize gospel ministry, devotion to sound love. Thank you for all that you have done and are doing in us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.